In the year of Rome, 798, Claudius, fourth emperor from Augustus, being desirous to approve himself a prince beneficial to the Republic, and eagerly bent upon war and conquest on every side, undertook an expedition into Britain, which as it appeared was roused to rebellion by the refusal of the Romans to give up certain deserters. No one before or after Julius Caesar had dared to land upon the island. Claudius crossed over to it, and within a very few days, without any fighting or bloodshed, the greater part of the island was surrendered into his hands. So says the Venerable Bede, anyway, in book one of his Ecclesiastical History of the English People. In reality, we know that this date is actually two years later than the fact, as Claudius actually landed in Britain in 43, not 45 CE. Not only that, Claudius's conquest of Britain was by no means without fight or bloodshed, as he claims. Rather the opposite. Despite the speed in which the Romans swept northward across Great Britain in the early years, they did indeed encounter armed resistance from the local Celtic Britons. Such resistance is what spurred the continual construction of a multitude of forts across the country. Forts interconnected by a vast network of roads in which the Romans used to consolidate their control in the newest province of Britannia. So with that background, we can skip forward some 10 years, and now Rome controls about half the island, but hostile frontiers against so-called barbarians remain towards the north and to the west against Wales. It was on this western frontier that one of the great Roman roads, Watling Street, was constructed leading from Kent to the location of modern-day village of Roxeter. It is this location that now happens to serve as a prime example of Roman settlement in Britain to us. Then known as Viraconium Corniviorum, <laughs> the site began as a small fort occupied by Auxilia. Later the garrison was replaced by an entire legion, specifically the 14th legion Gemina, and the fort grew to accommodate this, becoming a much larger legionary fortress. Viraconium was strategically placed as one of the multiple defensive structures used to hold against and launch attacks into the Welsh hill tribes at the time. Later, the 14th Legion were taken north and replaced by the 20th Legion, Victorious Valeria. In true Roman fashion, as the peoples of the region were subdued, their leaders were permitted to retain some degree of power while the people themselves were inducted into Roman society. The people situated near Roxa were known as the Cornovii, and they were soon moved from their own native capital at the hill fort on the Rekin to Viraconium Cornoviorum. It's from these Cornovii that the Roman fort, and later settlement, derived its name. Eventually, as the need for a fort in the region gradually diminished with the subjugation of the Welsh hill tribes, the 20th legion stationed here were assigned elsewhere. By now in roughly the late 80s CE, when the fort was no longer used by the military, the minor hovels that had grown around it had now developed into a small town. A decade after that, the town was expanding its civil street layout, following the layout of the old fort. In addition, the never-finished construction of a garrison bathhouse was soon repurposed into the town's own forum. A larger and more impressive forum, surrounded by columns, started construction another 30 years later after that, in the 120s CE, on the same spot. Excavations found that the completion of this new forum can be dated to the 130s, so it takes about 10 years for them to finish this by the discovery of a dedicatory inscription for Emperor Hadrian. In fact, it was during the reign of Hadrian that Viraconium Cornoviorum really flourished, as it grew to now cover a large area of roughly 173 acres. As well as the impressive forum, the town now also boasted a number of Roman temples, shops, and most famously, the Fermi Bathhouse. You can actually still see these ruins today, they're among the most prevalent, as you can see by the picture here. This marks the height of the Roman city at Roxa. For the next couple of centuries prior to the collapse of Roman Britain, Viraconium is estimated to have been the fourth largest city in all of Britain, boasting an impressive population of around 15,000, with a surprising amount of wealth to support it, likely from its ability to regulate trade into and out of Wales and the nearby region. In the end though, Viraconium Cornoviorum began to decline, much as many other Roman settlements did when the Romans abandoned Britain around 410 CE. Not only that, 
but the Carnovii tribe inhabiting the region had now split into two. With this divide, the city continued to serve as the capital to Powys, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, it's Welsh, one of the successor kingdoms to the tribe. For a short time, in the sub-Roman period, followed by a kingdom called Rockensata? You can see the name here, because my pronunciation is definitely abysmal. Beyond this, though, the once great civitas declined into abandonment, never to be used by the, to the same extent again. For this reason, as the only trace of modern settlement on the site, Roxeter, occupies only a small corner of the former city, it remains an ideal case study for a typical Roman settlement. So that's the history of Viraconium Conoviorum, but what actually remains of this once great city today? Well, I've already shown a few times that the city is now left in ruins, albeit quite extensive ruins, just next to the small village of Roxeter. Because of the ruins being left quite untouched throughout history though, they remain quite significant and include the largest freestanding Roman ruin in all of Britain. So clearly these ruins were no difficulty to first discover, nor was the site of Viraconium Conoviorum difficult to interpret, at least compared to some of the less extensive Roman ruins we have. However, it was by no means the easiest either. I mean, just think about some of the cities still standing today founded by the Romans, such as York or London. They have pretty much always been known as originally Roman settlements, just because the locations have equally always been home to some form of settlement since the fall of Rome. But back to the ruins at Roxeter, what in exactly was the site first studied? Well, according to EnglishHeritage.org, the first accurate record of a Roman ruin from the city was made by Thomas Telford in 1788, whose account provides detailed measured plans and views of the ruins, although the ruins themselves were robbed by local people afterwards. Around this time, little is still known about the ruins of the Old Work at Roxeter, as it's called, and they're mostly used as intriguing subjects for pieces of art. Supposedly later, in 1828, an impressive surviving mosaic was recovered, but this too was soon destroyed by extensive visitation. It wasn't until the mid-19th century when the growth of Britain's railway networks helped facilitate travel to sites such as that at Roxeter. Now antiquarians developed an interest, with London-based Charles Roach Smith and Henry Dryden of Northampton each making new and significant discoveries at Roxeter. Later, the first real archaeological excavation would take place in February of 1859, led by Thomas Wright, who focused on the iconic old work, given its obvious nature. This excavation saw great success quickly, as most of the old baths were uncovered, sparking widespread interest and publicity at the site. It was this popularity that launched Viraconium into the focus of Roman archaeology in Britain, and led to the sale of the land to the new Shropshire Archaeological Society. This society established a permanent custodian and a small museum here, which actually became one of Britain's first publicly accessible active Roman archaeological sites. Wright continued to lead excavations at Roxeter until 1867, during which time he also conducted an investigation of the Roman cemetery alongside Watling Street, where it enters the town at the northeast corner, as well as beginning to examine traces of Viraconium's original defences. Afterwards, the site was further excavated occasionally under a number of different scholars and archaeologists. These include the archaeologist J.P. Bush Fox, who uncovered a large section of the town between 1912 and 1914, revealing a row of houses and shops, including a larger townhouse. However, the First World War soon started afterwards, which ended these excavations abruptly, and the land soon returned to agricultural use after his season was over. In 1923, though, a second major site other than the Baths was discovered by Professor Donald Atkinson. He had uncovered the Forum, located directly opposite the Baths. The site was also used in major training excavation led by Graham Webster between 1955 and 1985. It was during this time that the location of the site as an earlier fort was discovered, after previously it was only theorised with the evidence of military tombstones. In 1966, the excavation started to expand beyond the baths and uncover evidence of timber buildings. This led to another major excavation, this time under Philip Barker, who utilised the then new technique of open area excavation. As well as these substantial digs, the Roman town at Roxeter has undergone many smaller excavations under different archaeologists through the 20th century, but was unfortunately slowed due to the expenses and destructive nature of excavating such a large site. 
Instead, we must now turn to more general aerial photography, satellite imagery, and geophysical surveys. However, we can at least safely say what the ruins at Rockstar are now, from the many excavations already conducted. As well as the substantial physical ruins, we have a Viraconium Conovium, we can also correlate information from across documents throughout history referencing the site. For example, we have many primary sources which very clearly refer to the site at Roxeter, and some which go in detail about the Roman town. Such documents include the 1st century Vindolanda tablets, the impressive Ravenna cosmography from the 7th century, an 11th century Domesday book entry, and many more later references which can be found in the Shropshire archives. Now I realise this has gone on for longer than five minutes, so first of all thanks for listening and sorry about that, but I just want to quickly finish off now by concluding just why Viraconium Conoviorum is an important case study for history. First of all, Viraconium was among the most populous Roman cities in all of Britain, and yet, unlike its contemporary counterpart settlements of the likes of Londinium or Iboricum, it did not quite survive. Londinium became London, Iboricum became York, but Viraconium? The best that got was the quaint village of Roxeter. But this is a blessing, as unlike York or London, Viraconium is, even as ruins, a pure form of Roman settlement, free of architectural or cultural influence of succeeding periods. It exists almost as a town frozen in time, albeit a town collapsed to ruins, but at the least those ruins are entirely Roman. Secondly, while most of the layout of the city and the buildings within it are lost, a remarkable section still remains, and not only that, it remains in comparably good condition. The best example of this, of course, being the largest freestanding Roman structure in the country. It's these two points in conjunction which allow us to piece together a clear and concise image of what Roman life and settlement was like in Britain. And with this image we can even begin to consider other less fortunate sites where the ruins might be far fewer or in worse condition, thus helping us to not only piece together an image of Roman Roxeter, but rather the image of Roman Britain as a whole, outside of the cities which continue to exist such as York or London. And while there is much more that can be said about Viraconium Conoviorum, both in its history and its excavation, each in great depth, I should really call an end here. So thanks again for listening, this is a presentation on the Roman city at Roxeter.